get started, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, that's very good. I have to run over that again. Usually I have to do I have to do that twice. But okay, I like that. All right. And so we've gone through all of these different little categories of law. But for me, I want to talk about the common law because for me that's really, that's really, that's the bread and butter for me. We've already talked about some of the features of the common law. I've already talked about how uh, it sets precedents. And this, another way of saying that is a stare decisis. That means that any other case, it, it, it gives us certainty in my business. I'm going to know whether or not when I open up this business and I decide there's one or two things that I want to do, I'm going to know whether I'm on good legal footing or not because there are cases, there's precedents which creates a, a doctrine of stare decisis which gives me certainty on whether or not whatever it is I'm doing in business is correct or not. And so that is the feature of common law. In this Trans Am trucking case, Judge Gorsuch didn't agree with the majority opinion. And here it comes, time for him to be confirmed or the confirmation hearings for the decision uh, to have him to fill that vacancy for the Supreme Court. And so there are hearings in the Senate for that particular, so that the senators can decide they'll grill the person, they rake them over the coals for the whole day, and ask them all kinds of questions about their past, and so that they can try to trip them up and vote the Democrats. Uh, obviously, they don't want this guy because he's going to replace a very strict conservative justice. And so this is a hearing, and at this point in time, one of the Democrats is questioning Judge Gorsuch about this Trans Am trucking case. You're going to be all right with this? <laughs> okay. So this is, and this is going to give you some of the facts of what happened. And 
he had fallen asleep. If you fall asleep waiting on 14 below zero weather, you can freeze to death. You can die. He calls him back, and his supervisor says, wait. You gotta wait. So he has a couple choices here. Wait or take the trailer out with the frozen brakes onto the interstate. Now, when those brakes are locked, and you're pulling that load on a trailer with its brakes locked, you can go maybe, what, 10, 15 miles an hour? Now, what's that like on an interstate? Say you're going 75 miles an hour, someone's going 75 miles an hour, they come over a hill and slam into that trailer. Also, he's got hypothermia. He's a little woozy. Probably figures that's not too safe. I don't think you'd want to be on the road with him, would you, Judge? Senator, um, uh, you would? I, I, or not? I, I, it's, a, I, it's a really easy yes or no. Would you like to be on the road? Would I want to be on the road with him? Yeah. Uh, with the hitched trailer or the unhitched trailer? Oh, my God. Well, yeah. Yeah. but especially with the hitched trailer with a locked brake. No, I, I don't think that Okay, I thought that was, I, I wouldn't yeah. want to be there either. Uh, yeah. And so what he does is he unhitches it right. and goes off in the camp. And then I believe he comes back 15 minutes later. And he comes back after he gets warm so that he can be there when it gets repaired. Right. Okay. Gets fired. He gets fired. And the rest of the judges you all fired know him. that's mm -hmm. ridiculous. He shouldn't. You can't fire a guy for doing that. It was, it was, there were two safety issues here. One, the possibility of freezing to death or driving with that rig in a very, very, in a very dangerous way. Which would you have chosen? Which would you have done, Judge? Oh, Senator, I don't know what I would have done if I were in his shoes, and I don't blame him at all for a moment for doing what he did do. Um, but, well, I empathize with him entirely. Okay, just, you. We've been talking about this case. Don't you? You, know, you haven't decided what you would have done. You haven't thought about for a second what you would have done in this case. I thought a lot about this case. Because and what would you have done? I totally empathize. And I'm asking you a question. Please answer questions. Senator, I don't know. I wasn't in the man's shoes, but I understand you why. You don't he know did. what you would have done. Okay, yeah. I tell you what I would have done. I would have done exactly what he did. I understand. I think everybody here would have done exactly what he did. Okay, so you decide to write a thing in dissent. If you read your dissent, you, you don't say it was like sub-zero, you say it was cold. The facts that you describe in your dissent are very minimal. But here's the, here's the law that, and you go to the language of the law, you talk about that, I go to the law. A person may not discharge an employee who refuses to operate a vehicle because the employee has reasonable apprehension of serious injury to the employee or the public because of the vehicle's hazardous safety or security condition. That's the law. And you decided that they had the right to fire him, even though this law says you may not discharge an employee who refuses to operate a vehicle because he did operate the vehicle. Is that right? That's your... That's how you decided, right? That's the gist of it. Okay. Well, no. Is that how you decided? That's what you decided, Senator. Right? I, I, there are a lot of more words in the opinions, both in the majority by my colleagues and in dissent. But that I'm, I'm happy to agree with you. That's the gist of it. Right. Okay. So we're going to come back. We're going to look at this. You still own this company, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know what? This is the thing. As lay people, we ju that wasn't that just a sad, that was just a horrible story, okay? And, and so you can get caught up in the emotions of it, but the law is the law. So you have to look at the law, and then you have to take the law, and then you have to apply it to the facts so that I can be able to give, you said Mr. Lopez, right? So that I can give Mr. Lopez a good, opinion on whether or not he did the right thing with the fire program. He's sitting in the car. 
Martin Luther King, he was 14 degrees below zero. Mr. Lopez? Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm just kidding. These are not your facts, but these are the facts of the case. And so here is the opinion. Okay. This is what a court of appeals opinion is going to look like. This one is published. It shows you who our three judges are on our circuit judge panel for this case. And Judge Gorsuch, with his lucky self, happened to be one of them. And so it gives us the facts. So we don't have to go through the facts again because the senator gave us a good, I mean, he really did go through the facts. I mean, very, I mean, very good, close to what it says here. But what I do want to bring your attention to are some of, this is an administrative law case, basically. And so, when Mr. Alphonse Madden got fired, he brought this case based on administrative law before administrative law judge. Uh, that judge uh, ruled in favor of the company, but then he appealed it to the de uh, Department of Labor, which is another administrative agency that will interpret that administrative law. In the end, however, once this case was appealed to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals, the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals sided with the decision that was rendered by the Department of Labor and against the company. And Mr. Gorsuch, who could have just, you don't have to write a dissenting opinion, he could have kept his little opinion to himself. However, he wanted to put it out there. And so then he had to live with it on national TV. And so this is what I do when Mr. Lopez calls me and he says, ah, ah, what am I going to do? I go find my little case. I say, Mr. Lopez, I'll call you right back. Let me go look in my cases and find out whether it was right for you to tell him to wait on the guy in the 14 degrees below zero weather. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a question. Um, when it concerns the law and pertaining specifically to this thing, is it a labor law states that an employer cannot put an employee in danger? And being in 14 below weather, isn't it a dangerous environment? <laughs> I know, it makes me mad. <laughs> I'm making go a dance. Lawyer, I guess it's a good go lawyer, go lawyer, go <laughs> lawyer. Yes, ma'am, but we got to wait. I mean, <laughs> Sorry, stepping ahead. Let me see. I'm just giving you some of the, some of the facts here. This is a discover that his auxiliary power, so, so he was not able to use the heat, so he's freezing. Okay, his speech, he called his cousin. His cousin testified, when I called him on his cell phone, his speech was slurred. Mm -hmm. Which I would have said that's a particular hearsay, but I wasn't there. And then he realized that, all, that he was numb. So, uh, he, t he so th th this is just the evidence that's given to the court. He also told the dispatcher that he was numb. These are all people who are going to come and testify and give evidence at this hearing. Uh, he came concerned about his physical well-being. Uh, well, let me go back. So he unhitches the truck, and he called his supervisor, Larry Cluck. Our facts tell us that by the time this case is heard that Mr. Cluck has passed away. Sweet. 
I heard you. You went, oh. He passed away. So he can't testify for you, Mr. Lopez, to give his reasoning for telling the guy all this stuff. You tell him he just, he's deceased. Okay. So, <laughs> so even he told Mr. Clark, his supervisor, he couldn't feel his feet. When he told him that, that he was leaving, he said, don't leave. He said, you, this is the part right here. Yeah. This is really, this is the part that got you. Yeah. He said, you can either drag the trailer with the frozen brakes or remain with the trailer until the repair person arrives. See, this right here is okay, except it's not just zero degrees. It's 14 degrees below zero. This is, to me, is reasonable. But this right here, but I'm gonna tell you what I would've said. I would've said Mr. Clark is no longer with us, so any facts that relate to whatever he said is hearsay. That's what I would've said, but that one, the judge would say, go home and have a seat. But I would've tried that. And so, um, so he didn't follow those instructions. He, uh, he unhitched the truck and drove off so that he could get warm. I'm assuming that leaving that truck running while he's sitting there would be dangerous. So he, he takes the truck, unhitches it, he drives off. When the repairman comes back, he comes back to the truck to meet the repairman. Okay, so after all is said and done, Mr. Cluck fires him. He's fired. The company fires him. And so, I'll go back to this. He's fired, and then he files a complaint asserting these administrative law failures on the part of the company. They're going to go, and they're going to file. Even the court is going to now. Let me just say this. All of this stuff that you see here in this opinion didn't just get here from the court. You have people, attorneys, who write briefs. And then based on which brief articulates the law, see, I, I would have given the court, if, if I'm working for Mr. Alfonso, I'm going to say, Judge, Here's the administrative law. And the law says that you can give deference to this decision that's already been rendered in favor of my client. Let me tell you why you can do that. Because here is a case that says you can. What is that case? Common law. And so you see definitions of that all throughout this particular opinion. This Chevron case was relied on heavily by the court, holding that an agency's interpretation of a statute it administered is owed deference by the court. So that means that the court, normally what I would expect the court to do is to interpret it. The court is saying, huh, this is so strong till really we have to stand to the side and give as much deference to that administrative law judge as possible because Congress has told us to do that. And so once I read this, I already know where we go. <laughs> but I go ahead and I go into all the different law. And so what I do, and what I teach law students to do, is to take their case, because when you go to law school, you have to brief cases. And then we sit in class, and then I grill people. It's, it's, a, it's a bit more intense than this. Because I really do. When they come, they better come ready to go to court with me. And so I'm calling on people. But what I tell students to do, is, and this is what I do today when I'm getting ready for a case, I'm going to take that case and I'm going to tear it apart. I've got my law in green, my common law is going to be green. Then I'm going to have my statutes, they're going to be in blue. Any analysis by the court, I'm going to have that in orange. 
I'm going to know, I can just look at this and tell what the court has said because it's an orange. And so when we really look at the rule, ma'am, here we are right here. This is our law. And, and I wrote it over here so that I can understand it. An employee who refuses to operate, this whole case came down to the definition or an interpretation of the meaning refuse to operate. Now, when you say refuse to operate, what do you think that means? Just didn't want to do it. Well, didn't want to do what? Operate the vehicle. Uh, in other words, frozen trailer. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That sounds pretty simple. You don't, we, we don't need a we don't do we need a court to interpret what that means? You would think we don't. This whole case, <laughs> and you heard the uh, uh, Judge Gorsuch talk about the fact, and and even the senator was like, everybody in here would have refused to operate the vehicle. So to come within the purview of this law, if this employee, Mr. Alfonso, I'm going to call him Mr. Alfonso, if he's going to sue his employer based on this administrative law, he's going to have to show that he was an employee who refused to operate the vehicle because of uh, a reasonable application of serious injury or the vehicle's Hazardous safety or security condition is all in here. I could have I it in there. And, 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 got to have all of this. So you can have this or this, but you got to have this. And the employee sought correction from the employer, but was unable to obtain the correction. That's the law. So I'm thinking, huh, okay. Refused to operate. That's simple. He refused to operate it. So what they're trying to determine is, here's Trans Am's argument. Here's your argument. This is what you said to the public. <coughs> you argued that because he drove the truck after being instructed to stay put, he actually operated it. He actually operated his vehicle. <coughs> so he didn't refuse to operate. Mm -hmm. he didn't. Wait. Wait. Did he? Did he? But then he stopped. He unhitched the faulty trailer. He refused to open he it or operate it the way he was supposed to instruct him to. He could have stand it. Lawyer, 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 lawyer. <laughs> Yes, ma'am? Uh-uh, okay, get, well, hold on. Yes, sir. Did the brakes from the trailer not work, or the... the woo Lawyer, 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 lawyer! I need to know that. Is it the truck's brakes that are frozen, or is it the trailer's brakes that are frozen? In an early edition of this class, I talked to you about critical reading skills. This is how I, I want students to develop critical reading skills because that's important. And see, that occurred to me too. So look what I did. I went back into my facts and I said, oh, the brakes on the trailer Okay, so now that I've told you that, what, what does that mean for you? Because he left the trailer there, yeah. he technically didn't operate. Oh! Oh, Jesus. Lord. All right, hold on. So tell me again what you said, Miss Lawyer. Oh, you're the one who was like, well, because yeah, well, he refused to operate it the way he was instructed Ooh, to. Oh, Lord. Lopez, let me tell you what the lawyer said. <laughs> she said he refused to operate the way that he, uh, that you instructed him to operate. So he did refuse. You understand? Yeah. Okay. 
This guy's supposed to keep a service log. If he's going across the country, he's got a service log you have to of before and after and every. The but we don't have that information. But they should have gotten it. They should but they should have gotten it. But who's the driver? You're going to be not the best. Your lawyer did not know enough about trucking. Your lawyer did not know enough about trucking. Mr. Lopez, I'm sorry to tell you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you, Mr. Alfonso, he got his cousin to testify. Nobody from your side came in and said nothing about none of that stuff you're talking about. Have you raised the dead lately? To talk <laughs> right now. You're not doing it. Is there a section where wait. Larry is talking to his friend Muff about? Wait, wait, there were two things. Well, wait, hold so on. Larry is super well, hold on, hold on. I got two over here, so just hold on. Yes, sir. It's 14 below. Yes, sir. And the brakes are frozen. I, I would I would guess that the brakes were not frozen when he was not in a place where it was 14 below. That's just my guess. Okay. I, I I'm going the, with you I on that. the weather had a, you know, playing factor into the brakes being frozen, obviously. Uh -huh. And I think with... Uh, but does it matter? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is where I'm going with this. Okay. Is that um, he kept on calling for service. And yes, he, he did. telling him the wait. Yes. And he's having... Uh, Symptoms of hypothermia, which right. is life threatening. Yes. I believe at that point it becomes an impending danger for him to just leave the area so he can find, like, he, so he, he himself doesn't die. You know okay. What I mean? Because he keeps on getting the same answer, you know, wait, wait, wait. Right. And but he's leaving so that he can run the heat in yeah, the cab. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. To, you know, to get warm. Himself, basically. Right. That's, okay, so you didn't want him to still, do that? He's still, you know, he left the trailer, he's going to come back for it, like he did. Yeah. And I believe that, you know. You believe that he should have done that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, rightfully so. Okay. I, I'm just going to hold my opinion. Yes, ma'am. I, 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 I'm with you. Okay. I, 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 it's 14 degrees below zero, Mr. Lopez. Yes, ma'am. Um, my thing. My comment was just in response to what he was saying about all the service logs and whatnot. Because if Trans Am Trucking had those service logs, then if they would have helped in their favor, then they would have used them. Yes. So if they didn't use them, then it's probably because that man did do everything in his power, you know, by the book. And somehow mm -hmm. that evidence didn't make it into the record. Right. Okay. Your argument is that he should not have left because he was frozen. Right, so what if he is experiencing hypothermic symptoms? If he, his foot is numb and he Or what if he's feeling not coherent okay. and so he unhitches. What if he, that's what there's a lot of people on the road at this time. What if he hit somebody? I'm then with who, you. Then who's gonna, 
But at that point, isn't it considered almost like, like the example if someone comes at you with, uh, with a knife and they're trying to kill you and then you shoot them, but you end up killing them, that's self-defense. So you're trying to save yourself before you save anybody else. He had a choice, right? die or possibly warm up. But that's when the <laughs> law and ethics are two different things. What's but none of these facts like are in die? our opinion. But hold on, yes sir. A lot of this is about like the service logs. I thought I remember reading, and maybe they read it wrong, there's a section about what Leary was writing up for, and there was two things he was writing up for. One was leaving the truck, another one was not stopping. You read that where? I can't remember where. It's talking about what Leary wrote him up for. That's where okay. you mentioned that Leary okay, wait, dead. Okay. Maybe it was that page. Wait, hold on. So it's got to be somewhere in here. Yeah. It would have had to have been. You're saying you read Clark it somewhere here. Clark informed me that he was being written up for abandoning the trailer. Yeah. You're missing his fuel stop earlier. I'm curious about that part. Like, you're missing so his fuel stop. Fuel so why did he stop? So he should have entered. He should have entered. He might have done that check. You know, at the fuel stop. Exactly. You're supposed to do things like that. Uh, yes, but if you read the facts, he says somewhere in here that he was not able to find a fuel stop right here. Uh, because he was unable to find the Trans Am mandated fuel station. Oh, so uh, where they pay for it. Bingo. The Trans Am mandated fuel stop. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, all said and done, we got our law, and then we're going to apply our facts. So Trans Am does not dispute the fact that it was dangerous or that the guy was having, um, you know, his health was at issue. They argued that they told him to stay put and he actually operated the vehicle. Since he actually operated the vehicle, he does not get the benefit of this law because he is not an employee who refused to operate his vehicle. Is that clear as mine? <laughs> well, he is not an employee who refused to operate his vehicle because he operated his vehicle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well the court says, first of all, in the beginning, we have already cited a rule that says we're gonna give broad deference. The law says for us to give broad deference, to give all deference possible to the administrative law judge's interpretation of what this means. They cited their case. So they're going to stand to the, stand to the side. They're going to go through here. They're going to say, here the term operate is not defined in the statute. If Congress had not directly addressed the precise question at issue, the court does not simply impose its own construction to the statute as would be necessary in the absence of an administrative interpretation. Instead, we examine whether the agency's interpretation is based on permissible construction of law because in the beginning, the law said to give all deference. So that's what they're going to do. Gorsuch is saying they need to strictly follow the law. That's what he was telling the senator. But the law says for them to give all deference to the administrative law judge's interpretation, not Judge Gorsuch's interpretation. <clears throat> and so Trans Am argument equates the term operate as used in the statute with driving. The RRB interpreted the term operate to encompass not only driving, but other uses of the vehicle when it's within the control of the employee. So I have most of you saying yes, you're right. Answer is yes. Okay. 
Yes, sir. Just a real quick, like, tie in with the whole case. Pretty much the whole case was basically defining this, right? The whole case was defining the, the in, meaning in of, of the refuse statute. to operate so that they could determine whether or not he, was he met, yeah, okay. well, not that he was in violation, but whether he would get the benefit of the statute. Oh, because okay. then if he, if he refused to operate, then that means that his employer fired him in violation of the law. Okay? Okay, here's our second question. What common law meaning of the term operate and or refuse to operate as set forth in the STAA was interpreted by the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals as a result of its holding in the Trans Am Trucking case? Ma'am, I'm going to come back to you for that answer. I'm sorry, what is it? Look at this question. What common law meaning of the term operate and or refuse to operate was interpreted by the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. You remember what you told me earlier? Maybe you're not very familiar with the instructed to? Right. Here it is right here. Operate or refuse to operate includes to operate the rig by remaining with the trailer until the repair person arrives if instructed by the employer to do so. And then one more. Do you agree with the majority opinion or Justice Gorsuch's dissenting opinion in the Trans Am trucking case? Yes. Let me see. Some people said B, they agree with Gorsuch. And this is a tricky case because, you know, you say to the employer, hey, Stay put. My guy's coming. That's a safe thing to do, you think. So, okay. So we are done with that. And if anybody has any questions, yes, sir. I was curious. Assuming that Larry was still alive, mm -hmm. um, can it, like regardless of how that particular case settled, um, uh, can the company kind of go after Larry and say, "Hey, what you know?" But he's dead. Well, but, oh, he's he no, no, because he's <laughs> acting as their agent. They let him fire this guy. They need to you. They, they can say, "Well, they fired him." No, the, no, no, no. He's acting as their no. Well, Larry should have given him that advice. <laughs> and if Larry's going to fire somebody, he needs to make sure they understand all the facts. And Mr. Lopez, when Larry gets ready to fire him, Larry needs to let Mr. Lopez know so that he can call his lawyer. So his lawyer can say, oh, so he rolled it. Okay. Are they... Oh, yes, I just have one statement. I don't okay. know if anybody around here has ever lived in the Midwest, but it takes about 25 minutes and 14 below the weather to start getting frostbite. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if it's 14 if you're, and if you have and if you have um, uh, skin that's exposed, mm -hmm. it takes even less, about yeah. 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. and then you start losing fingers and toes. Yeah, yeah. So he had already waited 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Then he called back. And the guy says, no, you need to stay put. And obviously he didn't hear him when he's saying the heater doesn't work. I, I don't know no. what, but we don't know because he's no longer with us yeah. to be able to give us those facts. Whether he understood him or not when he said the heater's not working, we don't know. But that that factors into the law because it creates an, a reasonably uh, unsafe condition. That's one of the uh, prongs to that test. Yes, sir. Did you have a question? No? Oh, yeah. Never mind. You forgot? Okay. Are there any other questions about this? What was the final verdict? The, the, that uh, Mr. Alfonso won. Yeah. Yeah. He got back pay and all of that. And he got his job back. Oh, he got his job back. <laughs> they, he, was, he went back to work for that company. <laughs> well, okay, let me say this. I don't know if he went back to work for him, but they were ordered to give him his job back and to clear his record, to take the whatever the disciplinary write-up was, uh -huh. to take that out of his file. Yeah, money? 
And he got, he, well, he got all his back pay and all of that. Yeah. So he probably did. we don't know so if he went back. Emotional distress. <laughs> well, no, if that's allowed in the statute, he would have been awarded that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about this? Okay. What I want to remind you of is to turn in your in-class exit ticket. I want to remind you. I went on there. Some people haven't finished their assignments. Don't get the clock strikes. 12 at 11.59. <laughs> Don't send me no emails and be like, oh, Professor Blackmore, quick question. <laughs> at 12.01, don't do that because I'm going to be asleep. Yes, ma'am. So, but it's just actually online for tonight. So, if yes. you, so there are some people who haven't finished, yeah, for tonight it's just the exit ticket. Next week is when the rubber is going to start hitting the road because you will need to make sure you have your Learn Smart and your exit ticket, your online exit ticket.